thank you, Jaya Feng, for inviting me yet again. And thank you all for coming. Uh, this time I'm going to talk about the future of electronics after 60 years of Moore's Law, because I guess you all know what electronics is and you all know what Moore's Law is, uh, but maybe it's not quite the same thing that uh, I've experienced. One thing I've learned is that if you don't learn from history, then you're just destined to repeat it. And, uh, and so although I'm talking about the next 60 years, I also have to start by going back and looking at where it came from. 1830, in fact, is more or less the start of electronics with the relay, which was part of the early electrical telegraph type activity. And it's an amplifier. A relay is an amplifier. It takes a low input current and it creates something which is capable of switching a very much higher current. So it's an amplifier. And if you think of electronics basically as the use of the electron for other than power purposes, then this is it. This is the first repeating a signal to make it be able to go further and further and further. And of course, we may laugh about it now because it's very mechanical. This is the Strouger exchange. The Strouger exchange is probably the peak of, where, of, of the achievement of the uh, relay technology, electromagnetic technology. And it, but it was the telephone system that was in use for 87 years, up until 1978. 1978 was about three years after I came in, out of university into the industry, just to give you an idea. These were very, very clever systems, but they were electromechanical systems. The technology, however, was ticking forward. It never stopped. They still hadn't invented transistors, they still hadn't invented valves back then, but by 1885 the people had got pretty sophisticated in their understanding of magnetic technology and they'd already come up with this thing on the left, the magnetic amplifier. I challenge you to look at that circuit and work out what's going on, because there's some twisted inductors there, they're wound in opposite directions. There's also this fella, that's a rotating machine. How are you going to generate AC before you've invented valves? That's a transmitter aerial at the top, so that is actually a, a more or less complete radio transmitter. And the, uh, the variable resistor there would have been a Morse code key. Um, over to the right you've got the valves, and of course those are some fairly primitive and initial development activities in the valve space, a diode at the left hand side and triode towards the right. Um, <clears throat> But this is a novel concept because they'd moved in technology from the behavior of a magnetic field to the behavior of electrons in a vacuum. Now, it's quite clever modulating the flow of electrons in a vacuum, uh, but it was very revolutionary in its day. And yet, at least in one concept, it still did the same thing. It was, you were able to make a switch out of it, and the switch was useful for controlling circuits. We tend to think of valves as being deeply historic, but this is what a quick search on the internet tells me. These are devices you can buy today. So these are valves which are in use today. There are relays, of course, you can imagine relays. Perhaps magnetic amplifiers are less obvious, but there are still some instances of it. But I wonder how many of you recognize that valve? Anybody? Let's just say you've probably used one within the last 24 hours. You may even own one. That's a magnetron, and it's inside every uh, microwave oven that exists around the planet. It's a valve technology because that valve give, enables you to produce high powers of very high frequency radio energy. So these are technologies which haven't gone away. They've just simply moved into various niches. There is a, a more prevalent technology, and you might be excused for thinking that that's microelectronics, but you have to remember, as an engineer, as a scientist, that these are all parts of the technology which help with the development of products today. Now, Einstein was faced with this problem, and he was challenged because he was finding that he was being described as an engineer and being described as a scientist. And he, and he tried to then come up with some sort of definition which would work. And he came up with that. It's fairly simple. Scientists event, investigate 
that which already is. Engineers create that which has never been. So you might tend to think of him as a creator of that which had never been. But actually, he used it to show that he was a scientist. If you think about his works, his works were understanding the universe. We didn't understand the universe, didn't understand materials, didn't understand how atoms work or electrons work or anything like that. He spent his time studying what already existed, maybe theoretically, which is very clever, but that's what he was doing. It's worth say, remembering this because scientists produce concepts. They, are, they understand or they strive to understand and manipulate the properties of the universe. Engineers are exploiters. They are people who are paid to take the technology, the science that is known about, and convert it into a product that somebody is prepared to pay money for. Um, there, is, there are engineers who produce things that fail as products, and there are people who specify products that fail to be produced. But the engineer's role is always to try and do that, to create actual solutions. <clears throat> and they have to do that by using available science, and that's an important one. It would be very easy to generate a product which is based on perpetual motion or anti-gravity, but as they are technologies which don't exist, then it's an engineer's role in life is not to create something like that, but to spot that it's impossible nice and early. So when in 1947 Shock Shockley, Bardeen and Bratton um, discovered the transistor, <coughs> They were discovered that thing over, the right, over to the uh, left. That's not a production transistor. I think you will all pretty well agree with that. That's a demonstration of a concept. And the concept that was being demonstrated here was the modulating electron flow in a solid, as opposed to in a vacuum. So we're not in a vacuum tube any, no, anymore, but it not surprisingly became known as solid state electronics. <coughs> the production version looks a lot more civilized. Um, it's still fairly primitive by comparison to a modern discrete transistor. But 1951 we're talking about here, these were transistors that were made one at a time and they were used in that scale. So transistors were used one at a time. When I was back in 1950 something, when I was all uh, approaching 10, eight, 8 to 10, I had a transistor radio. My mate had a transistor radio. His was worse than mine because his only had five transistors in it and I had seven in mine. How many transistors in your radio? Can you even identify where your radio is anymore? Which parts of it are done in transistors? Which parts of it are done in software on a compute system? Back then, transistors cost a lot. You bought them and they cost frequently in excess of a pound each. You don't buy transistors in an integrated circuit at a pound each. They're fractions, very small fractions of a penny. So we're dealing with a different thing. And that changed the way that you designed the system. In those days, you used analog because analog was more efficient use of a transistor. The concept of digital existed. The switch was still turning a light on and off. But, uh, and you could, the, the mathematicians had been working on the concept of computation, but the, the idea of using transistors, lots of transistors at this time when they were fairly expensive, was just out of the question. Now, in 1957, uh, Honey, really, and Kilby fairly soon afterwards, were the inventors of the integrated circuit. And it may seem a very strange thing to say, but that transistor architecture a planar transistor architecture, which you today call double diffused, um, was the breakthrough. And it, the breakthrough was all the connections could be on the top surface. That previous transistor, you could visualize it. It was standing upright and it had two connections, either side and a connection at the bottom. It was a three-dimensional structure. That's a flat structure. So it wasn't any great surprise when Kilby said, well, if we had a flat structure, we could put other things on the same flat structure like resistors and all of a sudden you can start to think of creating a complete circuit, an integrated circuit, albeit with three components and not using the same substrate. Kirby had made the mental jump associated with that and that really made integrated circuit as a concept made integrated circuit possible. In 1957 
Robert Noyce founded Fairchild to make the planar transistor that Herney had architected. But as soon as he saw the possibilities of the integrated circuit, he changed the corporate plan. And so in 1960, he produced the first digital commercial multi-component IC. This is four transistors and two resistors, and it sold for $120. And you can see it was a pretty small thing, even in those days, but there was only four transistors on it. But the thing about it was it enabled people to start to think in terms of implementing digital systems. <coughs> they were so enthused by the possibilities of this, in 1965, you'll find on the next slide, Gordon Moore had realized that the way this thing was going, you were actually going to be able to shrink it down every fairly regular beat, I think he said two years in the first instance. Um, and so they were so convinced about it that Noyce and Moore founded Intel, principally to produce memory chips. Memory chips, after all, are just a collection of flip-flops. And he could see where this was going. 1965, then, Moore's Law. It was a name given to it by Carver Mead, related to an article that Gordon Moore had written. And he was thinking that you could possibly by 1975 be looking at circuits which have got as many as 65,000 components on it. That was pretty revolutionary thinking. But the thing about it which I, th I want to point out at this stage is Moore's Law didn't actually start when he thought of it, when he observed it. He only observed its operation in transistors. It actually started back in about 1830 because that that initial relay was a big thing. They produced smaller relays. The initial magnetic amplifier was a big thing. They produced smaller ones. All, at every one of these stages, we were seeing reduction in active device size. So the Gordon Moore's law has been running since those very, very early analog uh, amplifiers. Now, solid state electronics planar solid-state electronics have been the maintaining technology since that time. But it's only since that time. And we also have to ask ourselves just how much of it has been stationary because everything has been developing around this industry and solid-state electronics is still to do with the flow of electrons through solid. But it's not about CMOS, for example. It could also be about bipolar. It could also be about gallium arsenide. Now, to put a scale on things, and I'm going to go into a digital world at this stage because I'm able to access more uh, slideware, which makes it more interesting. Um, back in 1965, which is the Golden Moors era, then the first 7400 series logic devices was being produced as well. And for 30 to 40 components, you could design something like that, which is a quad, two input, and AND gate, and you use that EDA approach, a slide rule and a pen and a piece of paper. But I want to point out one thing. When it was designed, when that chip was designed, it was designed with components, transistors and resistors. When it was used, it was used as logic. Now, it's a, it's a disconnect, but it's an important disconnect. Because when you design a system with logic, you don't have to worry too much about the detail of the implementation. You've separated yourself from the implementation. <clears throat> and when Gordon Moore was, when he had this concept, he'd been designing memory devices, 30 to 40 transistors, and was working on the next generation of them at 80 components. And in point of fact, he was working on the one at 300 components as well. Because... We've now stopped talking about components as resistors and transistors because as soon as you start to move to things like CMOS, then the only active devices in there are MOS devices. But they're not bipolar devices. They, these are MOS. They're uh, field effect devices. Um, but we didn't notice that difference because it was a technology difference which was underneath the logical functionality which was being delivered. Still... At the 300 t transistor level, we were able to produce this thing, which was something of a milestone product. It was the 4-bit ALU. Now, an ALU, you'll recognize from most of your CPU architectures, they all have an ALU in there somewhere. It's an arithmetic logic unit. 
16 logic, 16 arithmetic functions, all on the 4-bit operand. Very clever circuit. Not that, that, not that challenging, but you are able to deal with its functionality without knowing the logic gates which are in it now. This has moved up one level of hierarchy. The other thing about it was, although it was 4-bit wide, it was designed to be put together as two chips, 8-bit wide, or as four chips, 16-bit wide with the full knowledge that two years from now you'd be able to put all that onto one chip. So they are already starting to recognize that Moore's law is kicking in, that processes are evolving, and if you can design a circuit which is A uses logic and B recognizes uh, hierarchy, then you're, you're simplifying the design of your product. 300 transistor ICs enabled the first mainframe computers, the general purpose mainframe computers. There were some exceptions before that, but the jet, this is a commercial product. You could go out and you could buy this. You could get it installed in a computer room. You had to have a computer room for it. Now, it had as power about one MIP, uh, which is a fraction of what you're carrying around with you in your smartphone at the moment. Um, it used the 74 series TTL. It was only big companies that could afford it because you needed, apart from anything else, you needed a big room to put it in. Uh, it was principally used by the accounts departments because the accounts departments deal naturally with numbers. They've been writing it on paper for years and so it, was, it made an awful lot of sense to add up numbers and write them into a computer. Design departments didn't get anywhere near it for quite a few years. Um, the, although computers were used one or two in, in universities, even universities didn't have a lot of them. <clears throat> anyway, 1971 saw the first thing which we would call a CPU today. It wasn't actually a CPU when it was designed. It was designed as a chip which drove that calculator. I don't emphasize it's not a pocket calculator. It didn't have a display, you notice. It printed on paper because the display technology wasn't there. But the thing that was significant about it is this architecture. It's the architecture of a simple computer. It's got the ALU in it, it's got some instruction counters and, and uh, memory counters, and it's got registers. And it's able to do what we now would recognize as a CPU. It's the 4004, it was a famous part, and when I came out, into, out of university, it was one of the first things I tried to do was to use this thing to drive some test equipment that I was making. Now, I'll introduce you to this graph. It's from the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon, 1999, already quite a long time ago. The reason I like it is that it's got two, two lines on it. The blue one is the number of gates per chip, historic and future in its time. And the red line is the productivity, how fast people are designing, able to design those transistors into something useful. Now, it's a good graph because it's fairly easy to extrapolate it backwards to a point that I've already passed, 1975, which is about the 1,000 transistors per chip. Um, and the 10,000 transistors per chip capability was where the IBM PC made an appearance. So this is your first desktop PC, um, green phosphor on a black screen, no mouse, a keyboard. But that's, again, it's where the accounts department principally want it so they can now enter their numbers and design engineers were not allowed anywhere near it. Fairly soon after, in year terms, one, two, three, three years, Apple made its first appearance. This was not the Mac. This is the Apple desktop computer, so it also didn't have a mouse. It was just like an IBM, a bit smarter. Uh, the ARM chip, however, at 2,000, 200,000 transistors per chip was a bit different, and it more or less aligns with the introduction of the Apple Mac, the first Mac, black and white screen, about this big, but actually a GUI. And the thing that's most significant is both of them at this point brought in the mouse. So you had a graphical user interface and a mouse. They were considered to be very unprofessional because professionals knew how to write, uh, work, uh, write in ASCII and they knew about code and they knew about instructions. And so this idea of, um, uh, of using a mouse and a, gr a graphical user interface tended to make it a school product because this is something that kids would 
would use, not, not adults, not proper programmers. Now, I, I'm, the reason I've gone to follow this route, which is the ARM route, is that I, can, I have chip plots, and the chip plots are useful. This one here is the, it was a complete chip, it was the ARM2, um, it might have been the ARM2AS, but it doesn't matter. It was a full chip on one micron technology. And you can see there, there's a 4-bit ALU in that. So it's a 32-bit ALU in the full processor, but that's a 4-bit. That was a chip full, not many years before. And of course, only a couple of years before that, it was only four transistors. It wouldn't have even, that would have filled a chip. Wrong button. Yeah. Now, just four years later, something pretty radical had happened. That full chip isn't a full chip anymore. It's just the bottom corner of a chip. So your ALU is still in there, but the whole CPU now is still only a corner of a chip. The breakthrough that ARM had at this point was different from the breakthrough that Intel had. Intel said, I've got more silicon, I can make a more powerful processor. And that's what they did. They filled the die with additional logic to make the processor faster, to make its calculation, uh, move it into a 32-bit machine, into a 64-bit and 128-bit. Larger memory spaces, more registers. What ARM said is, there is a whole bunch of people who would like to put other stuff down on that chip and get a processor in there just to make it intelligent. And it was a breakthrough which differentiated the processor market. Up till that point, processors had been self-contained things. After that point, a processor is something that you put into your system to give it intelligence. Uh, but in 20 years then, we've seen the 4-bit ALU become a tiny part of a 32-bit RISC processor, which in turn is a small part of a typical chip today. It's an illustration of Moore's Law in action. And the other thing I hope to tell you is just how fast this thing is. Every two years, you're doubling the amount of uh, uh, f logical functionality you can put into this piece of silicon. But it hasn't stopped. This is still 1991. We know from history that it's got a lot further. So ARM kicked in at about one million transistors. The concept then of an IP block in a piece of silicon which is doing something else kicked in at about the million transistor level. Now today, back in 2012 anyway, uh, you could buy 20 billion transistors for five dollars. It was the micro SD was going to start to make an appearance, but to make a Two gigabyte memory, two gigabyte memory is roughly 10 times that number of transistors. So that's 20 giga transistors on that piece of silicon. Around 20,000 times the number of transistors in 20 years, 25 years. And 10 times the frequency. We mustn't forget frequency because if you've got a logic gate and you're switching it twice as fast as somebody else's logic gate, then you're capable of, do, of twice the throughput. So it's just like having twice the number of transistors if you can clock it twice as fast. So you have 200,000 times more functionality in a chip over those 25 years. But that's not the whole story. Uh, we also have a die shot here of NVIDIA's Tegra 3 chip, which was about the same as the Apple A4, which is the processor that they used on the first iPhone. Um, and that one has one billion transistors in it. So this is now not memory transistors, this is logic transistors. So it's transistors which are less dense, less optimally packed, packaged. But a billion transistors, think about that for a moment. You can't see it. If you peer down a microscope, that's the only thing you can see is a blur color. You can't see the tracks. But if you peer down an electron microscope, you start to see a bit more detail. And if you strip strip back the oxides, you start to look through all the layers of metal. And the thing I want to illustrate to you there is that those greeny circles are three transistors. Three of a billion transistors. Look at the way those three transistors are connected together. There's an awful lot goes on in the interconnect. It's not active, but it makes the chip into something functional. And they all have to be designed. Those other 999 million, 999 minus 3, gives you another 
roughly 10 times the functional density because of the, uh, the metal interconnects which are going on. So we're not just making these transistors smaller, we're making more of the area, the active area underneath, usable. So you can actually put the transistors in more densely if you're getting the connections up out of the way. That gave another times 10 functional. So we're looking at around 2 million times functional density increase over those 25 years. You don't just design a chip or a system which is 2 million times more complex using the same design tools. You've got to use different methods. So we have got a, produce, a product possibility offered by utilizing the billions of affordable encapsulable transistors is commercially beguiling. The marketing people say, wonderful, we can do this, we can do that, this is fantastic, we'll be able to produce products which are that clever, they'll be do, able to do all sorts of things. But having two billion transistors on a piece of silicon, no matter how small, is no use whatsoever if you can't design a circuit which is going to function. And so it became a, an important consideration at that point that how do we design systems with two billion transistors? <clears throat> because if you can't do it within a reasonable time, within a reasonable team, and with, re with a reasonable budget, it's not a product. Engineers have to deliver, bear that one in mind. So chip design required, and at this point was doing a major change. It had moved from clean sheet design into reuse based design. Even professional and military applications were losing control of it at this time. They wanted to design their own particular chips to do their own particular thing and they were quite happy to develop special processes to do it. They couldn't afford it anymore. The commercial processes were so good and so available and so cheap they had to go to the commercial alternatives. But it made companies like Arm who was actually selling a designer productivity tool and we didn't know it at the time. We were just selling a core to drop onto a chip. But it was, turns out the real value that was offered was productivity. <clears throat> so we can now start to look at the one million transistor level activities slightly different way. Because the second line kicks in about this point. At around the time when ARM was created, you could spend around 100 person years designing a chip. Now that's a real number. That's 100 people for one year. Um, it's, uh, it was a statement of reality. These chips, big systems, were complex things. They took a large team, but you kept the team inside. But the prospects for the future, 1,800 person years, 8,500, were getting ridiculous. You couldn't put that team together inside your company anymore. And the other thing that was starting to appear was this thing called the verification gap. And that is, it's not just easy to look at the output of this chip and see whether it's working or not. You can look at the output of a quad two input NAND gate with a scope and two switches and you can see the work. You can see the two input NAND gate working. It's only got four states. You can't do that with a billion transistor integrated circuit. So it means now that we're going to have to start investing an awful lot more in test environments in the simulation world before, before you can satisfy yourself that your chip design is, is complete. I want to emphasize at this point just how much of a change this was. Because back in 81, I designed a chip on my own. And I had a clean sheet of paper, literally an A0 sheet of paper and a logic template. And I knew when I finished because I got to the bottom right corner. And it was a thousand gates on a chip. As time moved on, you could still do design, but you needed a small team. You needed local teams as the complexity went up. And you needed global teams as the complexity went up. And you were still using some reuse hardware and software re reuse and nowadays we're using expertise reuse. So you now have people who are expert companies who are experts in particular areas who, de who are delivering IP, hardware and software and methodology to, into uh, a product which is being designed which incorporates all of them. This is not an industry for the loner anymore. This is an industry for the team but not just the local team but the global team. <clears throat>
And without very much more than 90% reuse, today's electronic systems would be unproducible. So don't let anybody tell you that the chip is the center of this any, anymore, or that the software is the center of this anymore, or that the application is the center of this anymore. It's the team which is the center of this. And like all good things we know about teams, the weakest link is the reason why it doesn't work. So it's what you haven't got which stops you working, which means that when you're designing products, you don't build in technologies which are not at least demonstrated with some degree of reliability. You've got to use things which are known. Fundamental to reuse is knowing about something, not guessing about it. So, ARM's product offering, which is often seen as just the CPU, actually, this is back a few years now, but it's still more or less correct. There's a million times difference between the smallest ARM CPU and the biggest ARM CPU. A million times difference between the two implementations. They're both, both called ARM CPUs. They're both instruction processors, but they are focused towards different ends of the market, and they have a lot more capabilities in the, in the bigger one, obviously. Um, 24 processors in six families when you count the numbers. But it's not all. This is a, uh, what do you call it, a modelled environment. So when, the, when somebody buys a CPU, they don't just buy the CPU, they buy an implementation. So this is an implementation described in a EDA tool flow, usually by VHDL or Verilog. And it describes a system implemented, the most complex system you can imagine. So we've got some quad quad-core A15 CPUs, which are the top-end ones, and there's one, two, three, four of those. You've got a stack of DSP processors over there, a whole bunch of places and hooks ready to, for people to hang their implementations on. They're not all going to implement this full system, so the first thing they do is they throw away all of the pieces that they don't want. But taking out VHDL is much easier than writing it. And so we had to provide this as a component then, of part of a methodology which goes along with the CPU, which just appears to drop into the silicon. And that's not all, of course. You still have to write code. So you have to write some software on that. But you actually want to start writing the software before the hardware is available, so you need simulation and emulation models over here. And it's not just one chip inside the average smartphone, and the smartphone is only an example product. There's 20 chips inside the average smartphone. And these days, most of them have got a CPU in it. Most of them have got an ARM CPU in it. Greatly attractive from the designer's point of view, because it's only one instruction set they have to learn, only one set of design tools, only one methodology. So they can use, and there's nothing stopping any of them using it if they want to do so, an Intel-based uh, uh, methodology. It's just that they won't get that LinkedIn environment in the same way. People want to reuse their design teams as much as they want to reuse the, the, the components inside, inside the chip and inside the software that's in used in them. Now, Moore's law guided the exponential density increase for 60 years, but it was delivered by a lot of individual companies and teams working in their own specific areas. There's a lot of steps in processes. Transistors and process architectures, photolith, masks, photochemistry, manufacturing machinery, methodology, metrology tools, measuring stuff. You've got to be able to measure stuff that you've created. Process and environmental control, better understanding of physics, physics of the, uh, of the atom, but physics of the transistor. More modeling, uh, better in process modeling, and EDA. You can't design a 2 billion transistor circuit without some software which is capable of handling two billion transistors. All of that lot had to come together, and they did come together, to keep Moore's law going. But there is problems. The problems are that although over the, that 130 years, devices have been getting smaller, the annoying thing is, is that atoms haven't. The atoms of the material are still the same size today as they were way back in the 1930s. And so we're now running into a problem that the physical size of the transistor, let's call it the physical size of the current carrying technology, is approaching the size of the atom. 
So the silicon crystal lattice is 0 0.4, 0 0.54 nanometer and today's processes back in 2017 were 20 nanometer transistors. So you can see there's not many atoms in every transistor. You can't keep this up for much longer. By the time we're getting to 20, 28 nanometers, then there's Guy Asanov in Glasgow University who's modeling the individual transistor behavior at an individual atom level. Just possible because the, uh, the number of atoms inside the transistors are getting smaller. It's already becoming very, very difficult, very, very expensive. The opinion in 2017 was that 10 or maybe 7 nanometers definitely represented the end for Moore's law. We'll come back to that and find out how true it was. Difficulty making nanometer scale structures. Um, the variability of the, pro of, the, uh, of the atom was starting to show through. I mean, an atom is actually a mathematical concept. Uh, it's got a lot of uncertainty. You remember Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? Well, when you've only got a few atoms inside your transistor, then that also means there is a degree of uncertainty about whether the transistor even exists or not. <clears throat> so is this the end of, the, of Moore's law or just the start of the end? Well, 2019, as hot off the press as I could imagine, June, TSMC and Samsung announced that they've got one more step on their ladder. They've got to five nanometers. They haven't really got it out as a, product, a production process yet. It's what they call risk production. If you're prepared to risk it, they will make a chip. They're not making any claims about reliability or electrical parameters or anything else like that. You can learn from it if you wish. But the 5 nanometer node is the first to make use of the extreme ultraviolet lithography machine. This one down here from ASML, uh, ASML in Holland. This thing uses reflective optics because there is no lenses that will transmit ultraviolet, so it has to be all curved lenses, all curved mirrors. It uh, has it a 200 watt light source, ultra extreme UV light source, which is implemented from a 20 kilowatt laser evaporating pellets of tin, would you believe? And that produces 200 watts of UV light. Um, global foundries gave up at 14 nanometers. Now, there's really only three foundries in the world at the moment. There's TSMC, there's Global, and there's Intel. And they, those, those guys are, you know, the leading edge. But Global foundries have given up at 14. They said they're not going to, they're not going to do anymore. They're still going to make processes, but they're not going to do the very, very smallest one anymore. They're still, they're going to do more clever stuff. They're going to incorporate analog. They're going to go 3D. We'll come back to that in a moment. Intel has failed to achieve its 7 nanometer process yet. And as Intel has always made its money out of being the lead process company, then this is a quite a big thing for them, for TSMC to come from behind and take them over. Um, anyway, just to give you some idea of the cost of this thing, each one of these foundries to make this is going to co come in at something like a billion dollars for a foundry, for a factory. One stepper is a hundred million each. Just think of that. And you need probably a half a dozen to have any degree of uh, flexibility inside your factory. T T sorry, Global Foundries actually returned the steppers that they had ordered because they decided they couldn't afford to continue to do it. So if you, the top left shows the traditional planar transistor, you've got the, uh, the drain and source and the gate on top, it's essentially along a flat process. Already we were going to FinFET, which is making the transistor bigger, but the transistor has now become vertical. It's not on the surface anymore, it's now vertical. And there is talk about going to what's called nanowire technology, where you actually have gates which are, these are parallel devices, but they are gates which, they are channels which have got a gate all the way around them. And some memory devices, stacked flash memory device here, if you look, you have to work out, look at it fairly closely to work out what's going on. You've got oxides and you've got gates stacked down the, the channels in that, uh, down the pipe in that direction. And you've got channels that run down the side. Uh, but that is, is an interesting step because to achieve that, you've actually got to have gates which are silicon, 
and the silicon has got to be a good quality crystal. So you've actually got to deposit good quality crystal silicon before you can start to make vertical structures. These are, broadly speaking, referred to as 2.5D. We're not really broken into major 3D, but have moved away from 2D. And this happened a couple of years back, but not very far back. A quick update to introduce Micron's 512 gigabit NAND flash memory, introduced in November 2020. This is a true 3D integration with 176 active layers placed on top of a CMOS wafer. That implements 5.7 million columns of 176 charge trap transistors placed in series. The base CMOS technology is for I.O. and control functions to make this into a usable memory die. And yet, despite those layers, the overall die thickness is only 0 0.02 millimeters thick. In real terms, around a fifth of the thickness of a sheet of paper. And it's available today. So to continue. Where were we on other approaches in this area? Well, you've got the uh, multi-metal layer illustrated here. This is the Apple A4 device again. Uh, ten, tra ten layers of metal on this one. They're not showing every one of them, but ten layers of metal represents ten masking stages. Rep represents a major yield penalty to get integration density. The transistors are right along the bottom edge. That's the active uh, substrate. And that's where the transistors sit. The metal is only making life easier. Sorry, A7, wasn't it? You also see the uh, section of the A7 package to see an interesting thing going on here. And that is there's a processor die, but there's also two memory dies in there as well. So we're not just putting one piece of silicon inside the package. Already we're putting three pieces of silicon inside a package, the package of which is only two millimeters thick. So it doesn't look any different. It doesn't look like a big chunky thing. But if you consider that the depth of a transistor into the substrate is only measured in nanometers, then you don't actually need much substrate to put a transistor into. Which not surprisingly then takes us towards three, proper 3D integration. Now, 3D integration as a concept is wildly um, interesting because over here at the left hand side is what they call the 3D superchip. Um, I do know who, who gave me this diagram but I'm not really allowed to say. But they're working on it. Um, this is a government lab and what they're talking about here is stacking chips with different substrates. So you're able to have a memory chip, a sensor chip, uh, CMOS uh, DS, uh, for general purpose signal processing, Power IC for power management, logic, uh, flash memory, DRAM, SRAM. All of these have slightly optimized and different processes. And they're shown there as being a stack of individual die, but they don't have to be. They can be like this implementation over to the top right, which is also a real section of a real chip which is in prototype manufacture. It's got three levels of transistors. And there's no reason why it should stop at three. Of course, that doesn't have to be um, the only thing you can do. You can still combine it with sophisticated packaging technology. So this is CEA, who is the French nuclear research lab. They're implementing this because they're involved in uh, high-performance computing, the um, gigascale uh, uh, performance and the HPC systems. And they want to package high package density silicon, but they also want to incorporate it in high package density systems. And so they're talking about a chiplet here, which incorporates 96 cores, plus memory, plus some other things, because it's a stack die. Each one of these packaged elements represents 96 cores. 100 of those go onto a board, and 10,000 of them go into a HPC system. So you start to see the sort of thing which is becoming possible once you start to, to look more seriously at packaging. Now data processing has been the driver of electronics and this is one of the first valve demonstration concepts. 
which is the baby computer at Manchester. Data processing has been the principal driver of electronics at one stage, and that was professional data processing, whether it's mathematical calculation or simply keeping good, good accounts. But today, the technology is being driven not by the professional applications anymore, but by the consumer applications. So the billions of devices which are sold, and I think armed, ARM's products went into 12 billion uh, ICs last year. That's a staggering number. That's more than the population of the Earth. Uh, but it's cho the, the technology development is being led by consumer these days. And it means that the volume of deliveries are right up there on the right-hand side. Back in 1970, the only kid on the block was the professionals. It was the only ones with the mainframes. They were the ones who were leading the development, but now the consumer leads the development. It doesn't mean the professional applications have gone away. It just means that the professional applications have got to make use of the consumer technologies. It's worth remembering, especially if you're planning to be an engineer, the role of the engineer is to deliver. Um, it's to deliver a commercial opportunity. Businesses only exist because people buy their products. They only develop products because they want to stay ahead of the market or they want to use a new niche or they identify something that a consumer has identified. Their forward vision is not that great, so they want to do it as quickly as possible. So from a design engineer's point of view, whatever they do, it's got to work. You don't get any greater accolade if, you get it, if, it, if it nearly works. It's a failed product. Economical, it's got to be producible. It's got to be reproducible. Fine making one, but if you can't make a billion and that's what the market requires, it's a failure. It's got to be innovative because there are other people who are trying to get that market as well. You're making, you're being a clairvoyant. You've got to predict with a high degree of certainty that you can deliver what you've promised to deliver in the time scale that you've promised to deliver it, at the cost that you've promised to deliver it, and at the quality that you've promised to deliver it. These are all things which are part of the design challenge. Again, if its quality is, not, is, is inferior and if the product fails in the market, it's a fail. Companies go out of business if they don't get their next generation of product into the market as predicted. So the design engineer has to use appropriate and available technology. It's not the fanciest, the newest, the most optimistically promised. And an engineer's job has got to be to listen to all those promises and decide which of the things are reasonable risks and which are not. It's about working with others. It's about working in teams globally, inside the company and outside the company. It's about networking. It's about not being precious about your idea. It's about realizing when somebody else has got a good idea and you clap and you applaud and you go with their idea despite the fact that you've had what you thought was the best idea up till that point. It's about being thinking around and about the problem, which means that you've got to have some knowledge beyond your specialist area because you need to be ingenious. You need to think, hey, that guy's got a good idea over there in optics. We could do this optically. We don't have to try and do it digitally. Or we could do it in software. We don't have to try and do it digitally. The best solutions are the ones which are competitive and which are there. So the design engineer's role involves a lifelong scientific learning. You've got to spend your life looking at the technology that you're going to be specializing, specializing in as that moves, but you've also got to be aware of the things around it that could be relevant to you. And it's all becoming systems these days. So, conclusions. There's no doubt that over the last 60 years, the increasing use of planar integrated circuits have transformed all our lives. Society is now dependent on them and expects engineers to deliver regular performance improvements in all these areas by making use of new technology. But it knows very little about what that actually means. So, it's true that as integrated transistors approach the size of the atoms, then conventional Moore's law must end soon. But does that also mean the end of the regular performance improvements which are expected? No.
Actually, Moore's law has always been a system density concept. And it started around 190 years ago with the first electronic systems. The planar integrated circuit has been the primary vehicle for the last 60 years, but it cannot be for the next. So a higher integration density will come from advances in 3D processes, assembly, but also the tools and methods which are necessary to support them. And of course, functionality in the box then will become the new metric for Moore's Law. So I'll end there. Thank you very much for listening.